But thank you all for getting me out of the president's meeting with the cabinet this morning. And so thank you for that. Let me ask you a question. How many of you uh, want to be a leader? Raise your hand. Okay? Everybody look around, see if the hands are up. Now, how many of you that have keep your hands up? Okay? Keep your hands up. So, all right, so of you. Now, those of you that have your hands raised, how many of you know what it takes to be a leader? Okay, now this time volunteers. What about you? What does it take to be a leader? Control a group of people. Okay. All right. Somebody, some, somebody over here had a. What, what does it take to be a leader? Huh? Loyal. Okay. Loyalty. Over here. What does it take to be a leader? Confidence. Okay. Somebody over here. Sacrifices. Sacrifices. Okay. Somebody in the middle over here. Passion. Passion. Compassion or passion? Which one? Or no. both? Both. Okay. All right. Somebody in this area over here. Okay. Charisma. Charisma. Now that's an interesting word. What, what do you mean by that? Because there are two different ways to talk about that. I mean, what I to Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. This is helpful for me. Now, when I was in your uh, place as freshman, sophomore, senior, and some of you might be even fifth year senior, but we won't talk about that today. Uh, several years ago, over 20 years ago, I didn't know what it meant to be a leader. And people had various concepts, just like you said, okay? The most uh, dominant concept was what Alex says, to be able to control the crowd. That tended to be the one that kind of raised up to the top. And it was a power issue, okay? Um, sort of like you said about charisma, you know? It wasn't necessarily earning respect. It was getting people to follow you. And I was taught in college that you're not a leader if nobody's following you. So if you wanted to be a leader, then you had to get yourself out front and so that people would follow you. And you had to be, somebody said confident. Who, who said confidence? Somebody over here. Confident. You had to be confident in yourself, right? <coughs> to be able to say, I'm the person, I'm the leader, right? You had to make some sacrifices. Uh, somebody over here, passion and compassion. Uh, you had to be passionate in that you believe what you thought was right. Compassion, well, that really wasn't in the vocabulary of the folks that I heard from about leadership. And so, I grew up with this strange notion of leader being the one that's in charge, out front, kind of like in athletics, the coach, okay? And in high school, when I played <coughs> athletics, my coach always said, be a little better today than you were yesterday. Now, that's a corny phrase. And I was a young, naive kid, but I was gullible enough to believe that. I really believe that. And something about that phrase, even today, some 25 years later, still motivates me to be better today than I was yesterday. And so for me, it became a personal quest, not necessarily to be better than somebody else, okay? But to say, here's where I was yesterday. Let me try to see if I can be better today. Now, I am no longer an athlete, as many of you can tell by looking at me. And so I take that to say, okay, so how can I be better today in how I interact with people? How can I be better today in how I treat people? How can I be better today in how I serve others? Putting the needs of others, not necessarily above <coughs> my needs, but also on the same lines with my needs. Because I have a fundamental concept that if I put others' needs ahead of mine, then I don't have anything to stand on. If I'm always giving myself to others all the time and have no place to stand, then I kind of become the servant of others and become a doormat. And most of us, if we're honest, we don't want to be that. So we'd rather be the leader, the one that's up front, Today I want to talk to you a bit about servant leadership, and you're going to be reading about servant leadership, and in a few minutes 
I'm going to show you a video that kind of capsulates uh, capsulates uh, servant leadership in a whole. <coughs> but servant leadership for me begins not by controlling people. It, it does have courage. It does have charisma, but not in charisma in the way that you're the person up front and you're the Pied Piper leaving everybody behind you. It has charisma in the sense that you're sharing your gift with others. It's service modeled first. <coughs> My father was the son of a sharecropper. And he's got a third grade, he had a third grade education. Didn't know a lot of stuff in school. Because of the circumstances in his family, he quit school and went to work. Third grade. And he worked until he was 78 years old, which was roughly about two years and six months ago, and he passed away. And all he knew was work. My father had his own company. He was a concrete contractor, and it was a family business. I'm named for my father. And so it was expected of me to follow in his footsteps. What my father didn't necessarily appreciate or maybe not understand is I was more of a mama's boy instead of a father's boy. I don't like getting my fingers dirty, hands dirty at all. And so working outside doing construction work really wasn't my cup of tea. I did it for a while, but I found out I'd rather be in an air conditioned building in the summertime and a heated building in the wintertime. That was just my comfort zone. When I did work with my father, I did all the grunt work. I didn't do any of the glorious work. I did the grunt work. After all, I'm the boss's child, right? And my daddy would give me a 15 cent raise. This is in the 80s. And he said, you're gonna get a 15 cent raise this year. And I'm thinking, gee, dad, thanks. I went from $5 an hour to $5.15 an hour. And that was making a lot of money, according to my father. Now, I could have quit, and I could have went to work for a restaurant, wait on tables, or, or do something else. But somehow, working with my father, even though I didn't like getting my hands dirty, was appealing to me. The part that wasn't appealing was that I had to hear him at home and at work and at home again. I never got away from it. One of the things that I look back on now that I think about that helps me to make sense of this is my father was demonstrating to me what leadership was about. Now, my father was one of these type of people. He was a, the strong, silent type. Didn't say a lot of things. Didn't do a lot of commanding. In fact, if you went on the job, you wouldn't know that he was the boss because he was the hardest working man out there. Okay? All the people that worked for him were the ones that were talking to the people that we were doing work for, but not my daddy. He was out doing the backbreaking work. Now, he owned the company, and you would think because he owned the company that he wouldn't be doing the manual labor that the other workers should have been doing. But he didn't see it that way. He believed in working hard. And so I learned something about leadership when working with my father. It's about doing a good job, okay? And it's not about doing a good job for you as an individual, but it's a larger perspective. It's doing a good job for our larger group, whether it is a job for an individual, whether it is an institution, or whether it's an organization that you're working for. It's always about doing your best to help others. When I got 16 years old, my dad gave me the keys to his truck, and my job was to be the go <coughs> And so my job was to get coffee in the morning. My job was to go get the sausage, biscuits, and lunch. And it was also to go to the halfway house to pick up some workers, the day laborers. Because sometimes we had jobs 
that required more effort than we had manpower to do. And so I had to go to the local halfway house and sit outside, and I blew the, the horn of my father's red F-150 pickup truck twice. And that was a signal. And folks just came out, and they just burst forward, jumped on back of the truck, and I pulled off. Now, i got to admit to you, those were some rough times because most of the people that came out of that halfway house, I was afraid of. I didn't trust them. <coughs> they, they looked, they smelled, and they acted in a lot of ways badly. But Daddy said, everybody deserves a second chance. So I'm going to give them a chance to work. I'm going to give them a paycheck, and they're going to help us do this job. And so as I go back to my hometown, there are a lot of buildings that I look at that I had a hand in building, and nobody knows it. In fact, I had a hand in building, and a lot of these folks from the halfway house worked alongside me. I learned a lot about leadership then. My father taught me about a service model leadership over a power model leadership. You're going to learn about this when you begin reading Kent Key's The Case for Servant Leadership. He talks about the difference between a power <coughs> over model and a service over model. A power over model is a traditional leadership where the bottom line is winning. You try to control people. You get people to do what you want. You bark out orders, you dictate, and everything centers around the leader. A service model of leadership looks at taking care of other people, meeting the needs of others, serving others first. I learned that working with my father. It was reinforced with other people in my life, in college, in graduate school, and other professional areas. Servant leadership is leading by serving others, is putting the needs of others in the same category as your own needs. It's looking at trying to make sure that everyone around you is served. Treating people the way that you would like to be treated. It has a moral background. It's relational. It's people first. This servant leadership model has been used in businesses across the country. It's been taught in schools. We use it here. We have at least two, three, uh, sir, four, if I'm not missing, servant fellows, if you're a servant fellow, raise your hand. Five. You, you, you. Okay, we have five in here. And our servant leadership model looks at leading by serving others, and it's community oriented, where students begin to look at their passions and try to take their passions to meet a need in the world by <coughs> creating some type of service project to meet a need in the community. And this has been going on for at least 12 years, and we have students here that are doing that. 